I'd like to call to order the uh, call to order the Northtown Municipality Council meeting of Tuesday, March fifth, twenty twenty four. Can I have a moment of silence and pledge of allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, can I have roll call, please? Rebecca Smith? Here. Shot B? Here. Tiffany Henley? Here. Lauren Hughes? Here. William McCoy? Here. Dustin Cleaning? Here. Thomas LaPera? Here. Can I have a motion to approve the previous minutes? Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, tonight we had an executive session announcement on personnel and um, personnel litigation. litigation. Um, and we'll move right into presentations. Tonight we have PA American Water presentation by Senior Manager in Government External Affairs, Kara Wong. Is the PowerPoint, it's ready? Okay. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> um, this isn't, this isn't. <laughs> you need the thumb drive again? How about we just scroll? Is that okay? Oh. All right. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Thank you for having us this evening. My name is Kara Ron. I'm with Pennsylvania American Water. And I'll have a few of my colleagues join for the presentation as well. I really wanted to have some of our subject matter experts go over some of the topics here. But just to kind of kick it off, it was just suggested that occasionally we come and say hello, uh, be available to answer questions or offer some business updates of what's happening in and around our company as it relates to the municipality. Um, so we'll just go over a couple kind of intro slides very quickly in the essence of time. Um, then we'll get into some local specifics. Um, so Pennsylvania American Water is an affiliate of a company called American Water, and I just wanted to kind of give the sense for, at our corporate level, we are, uh, we serve 14 million people in the United States, and we are regulated in 14 states, but serve military and other bases in a total of 24 states in the United States, um, with a total of about 6,500 employees. Um, and then here, if you kind of drill down into our Pennsylvania footprint, this just kind of gives you a sense for our size and scope. Um, as it relates to the Commonwealth, we serve about 2.4 million customers. So that's about 20% of the population in Pennsylvania are a Pennsylvania, water, Pennsylvania American water or wastewater customer. And you can kind of see some of our totals there. Um, and in Montgomery County specifically, we do have both water and, and wastewater services. Uh, depending on, on where the customer lives. Um, just from a kind of a business acumen perspective, and in Pennsylvania, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview uh, as a leave behind if you have any other specific questions, but this is kind of the sense for our assets and the, the um, miles of main, miles of sewer, uh, water treatment plants, things like that in Pennsylvania that is under the um, Pennsylvania American Water jurisdiction. Um, and we are the largest water and wastewater provider in the Commonwealth, but also in the country. And you'll get to meet some of our, our core team players here coming up in a bit. Um, and just to kind of set the stage, from a water quality perspective, we're heavily re regulated by EPA, DEP, the Public Utility Commission. And we are just proud, specifically in Norristown, our Norristown system and our plant there is a, an elite phase President's Award. So, so basically for more than 20 years, we have been exceeding expectations of our regulators, and we um, were really proud of that. And that's uh, a little bit about the award. I don't need to 
go into too much detail, but this is a volunteer, a voluntary program that, um, that we're proud to uh, have specifically here in Norristown amongst 33 other of our plants as well. Okay, and so that's just kind of a big, a big picture, but Justin Brame here um, is our manager for Southeastern Pennsylvania, and he's gonna join now to just kind of go drill down a little bit and make this more relevant for today's audience. Uh, good evening, council and members of the community. Um, my name is Justin Brame. I'm the senior manager of operations for Southeast Pennsylvania, which you can see the kind of the footprint there. Obviously, Norristown, um, got Royersford Glen Penn up in the Reading area, Coatesville, Coatesville Wastewater, Sadsbury. So we have a magnitude of, of different facilities among Southeast Pennsylvania, where we have about 120 dedicated employees uh, to ensure we meet, you know, all of our regulatory and environmental um, regulations set forth by the DEP and the EPA. So uh, specifically in Norristown, uh, we have 27 dedicated employees that oversees um, uh, 300 and, you know, almost 400 miles of a distribution system, including six tanks and a, and a multitude of pressure reducing stations, booster stations, pumping stations to ensure adequate water supply and pressure for all the citizens of, the, of all the different municipalities um, uh, listed there above, and also to ensure that we have adequate fire suppression and meet the needs uh, of the public safety uh, side of things when it comes to having adequate water supply um, for, for all of our customers. So about 400 miles of Maine, uh, uh, almost 1,700 hydrants. Uh, we pull water out of the Schuylkill River and do about 12 million gallons a day. Um, we're allocated for more than that, but about 12 million gallons a day is typically what we're doing out of this facility. Um, we have about 34,000 service connections, which totals about 90,000 people. Uh, so every day, the decisions we're making and, the, and what we're doing at our water treatment plant, uh, those services and that water is put out to our uh, almost 90,000 people in the, in the greater area, that also uh, you know, including Norristown. Obviously, we have a long history here um, back in the 1800s, Pennsylvania American Water has been um, running the system since the early 60s. Um, but a lot of history in the area and a lot of history with American Water um, in the area here. Uh, some of the new technologies we're implementing to ensure um, that we're protecting not only the environment, but uh, trying to protect the cost of what it costs to, to produce and make water safe and palatable is we yeah, installed some new leak loggers. Um, it's a new technology we've been in implementing for the last couple years. And these leak loggers, what we used to have to do to find leaks, we'd have to kind of have the water surfacing. We'd have to go out and manually sound hydrants and valves throughout the system. These leak loggers, we put in several thousand um, across the southeast. And overnight, usually about 2 or 2.30 in the morning, they turn on for just a minute or two, and they actually listen to the sound waves that are going through the water main and listening to the frequencies, it can detect if there's a leak in the area. And then we can go out to that. In the mornings when we come in at about 7 a.m., our employees can look at all the loggers. Any logger that showed a leak overnight, we can go then investigate and correlate and try to find that leak as quickly as possible. That's um, a value for, for us, and it's a value for our customers, and it's a good value for um, the environment to make sure that we're not uh, wasting our, our precious resource. Um, so that's just a little bit about some of the technology we've been putting in um, in operations, and then uh, go to the next one. I think Jerry, I think you're up for talking about capital investment. All right, hello. My name is Jerry DeBalco. I'm the engineering manager for Southeast PA, and uh, and as such, of an engineer in the engineering department, we have from very. Um, smaller capital projects to very large, uh, tens of millions of dollars of, of infrastructure that we replace. The, one of the things, that especially in the Norristown area over the past five years, you can see that we spent uh, the, the cost item, uh, column right there, the third one is about $26 million in, uh, out in the streets and roads of, of pipe in the ground. So water main throughout the, uh, through, uh, infrastructure on through through the, the streets within the Norristown district but we in the past five years we also spent uh, in, um, up to about 97 million dollars in um, between our plant and including everything uh, plant and booster stations and um, all, all, all of the infrastructure from the plant to the, all the, the 
uh, tanks and infrastructure out in the system. Um, some of the bigger uh, plant projects that usually we get involved with um, is uh, in the past year we've been doing a lot of the flood improvements from the, some of the uh, previous flooding events from the insurance requirements. Uh, we, we looked at uh, 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 hardening our, our facilities, especially our Norristown water plant to, to try to make it uh, more, more resilient to flooding events. Um, in 2021, we did a big upgrade as far as the uh, UV improvements. UV is an additional layer of treatment. It's, uh, we still add chlorine to carry it through the water, but um, really UV is added at the plant to uh, really from outbreaks that you, you probably hear from national news of, it was a Milwaukee case of, of cryptosporidium and trying to, uh, to, to protect it. That, uh, that was rolled out as requirements uh, through, through EPA to DEP and then to, throughout each of the systems. So that was one of the, the things that uh, the UV gives us added le level of protection uh, for all the consumers. Um, really in, in our filter upgrades was something that started at the end of 2022. Uh, uh, we actually started, uh, we're up to about five, five and a half, six million dollars. We took one filter out at a time investigated it to make sure everything was okay. Uh, I think uh, five or six of them had to be totally replaced, the under drains, everything, all new media. And then we take that one, get it up in service, and then to the next one. So we started that in 2022, and we're still continuing that uh, right into the first quarter of 2024. So that is, it turned out to be a bigger project than we thought it was, big, but we never, you never know until you dig those out and try to uh, get down. Uh, some of the projects that are coming up in the future, uh, the, the, the generator project out there, that was more of a resiliency thing as far as flooding at the pl plant, as far as storage for capacity to make sure we uh, uh, could keep the plant running uh, for an extended period of time. Um, and, and just some of the uh, details at the plant there of, of we have a lot of, a lot of piping, a lot of valve, a valve replacement project that Okay, so valve replacement, well, these are big valves and they are, we were talking about a million to $2 million of valve replacements uh, and a new blower system for our intake. So, um, as far as the distribution system, I'll hand it over to Ed. He, he handles all the, the street. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ed Opchinski. I'm the construction superintendent for Southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, I manage construction projects basically from the Delaware River back to Reading. Um, in the um, borough of Norristown, or the municipality of Norristown, uh, we've done quite a bit of work over the last few years since, since I, I started working here. And a, a big focus on that has been, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, we've been here since the 1800s. Um, we have our plant right on the river, and essentially all the water that goes out to both Norristown you know, Lower Providence, East Norton, West Norton, Whip Payne, all that water originates in Norristown and essentially moves through Norristown before going to those other towns. Um, so we've had a big focus on uh, upgrading our older, larger, uh, what we call transmission mains uh, to move, basically to move that water both through the town and out into the surrounding towns. Um, a couple of the bigger projects, the, the Main Street project, uh, we're finishing up right now. This has been kind of an ongoing project from, I believe we started in 2014, replacing all the infrastructure starting at the Plymouth border and working our way into town. And we're, we're up to Barbados Street right now. Um, and the last couple of sections have been a uh, really large diameter pipe. We're up to 24 inch uh, running between uh, Swede and Barbados Street. Uh, we had to tie into a really large diameter main at, at Swede Street. Um, so th that, that's our project essentially, um, tying into our transmission mains. In uh, the West End, uh, we've done, which is good. There we go. This, this shows a little better our projects. Um, this is all, this, this is a map kind of showing the, the projects we've done in, in the borough, in, uh, in Norristown in the last three years. And the West End project down there, you can see kind of Forest Avenue, uh, Lafayette Street, Washington Street. We're kind of building a new backbone from our treatment plant uh, along the river up to our Forest Avenue booster station that sits on Marshall Street. And 
the, the, big, the big win on this project has been um, essentially we're, we're replacing uh, over 300 customer services just in, just in that little area alone. Um, when I'll go into an, on the next slide, but whenever we find galvanized services on either the customer side or our side, we're, we're replacing them. Um, we're improving, improving fire flows, um, basically just upgrading the entire water infrastructure on the streets. Uh, some of the other streets around are just are kind of smaller, smaller streets, but the, the sum total of all the uh, pipe work we've done in the last three years is over, over 25,000 linear feet uh, of water main replacements uh, just, just in Norristown. Uh, our lead and galvanized service replacement program is something new as of as of 2023. Uh, we're required to go through the system and do a survey to determine both the uh, company side, which when I say that, that would be from the water main to the curb, and then what we call the customer side, which would be from the curb stop into the home. We're required to conduct an inventory of both of those things, which is a real heavy lift for us because historically we've only ever really cared about what we owned. We never really looked at the customer side. So now we're going through determining all the customer materials, and then um, as we find them on our projects, uh, we're replacing them uh, at no direct cost to the customer, um, which is a huge historic change for we used to, whenever we used to find leaks on customer side in the past, if it was a galvanized service or whatever, it would go right to the customer and they would have to repair their line. Now the galvanized and the lead lines, uh, we just hire a contractor and bring them in to replace them. Uh, the only other one, other thing I wanted to highlight on, on, on all, all my projects, there's a real close partnership between uh, myself, the American Water Team. We work, you know, almost every, not every day, but regularly with, the, with Thomas Odenigmo, Tommy O'Donnell, um, Jeff Beal. These guys are, it, it, it's a big team. We all work together, and, and it, it, works, it works seamlessly a lot better than it does in a lot of our other towns. Um, and we really appreciate their help. Thank you. I'll just wrap it up here, um, but wanted to thank you for allowing us a few speakers, but wanted to really put some names with faces uh, for councils, uh, certainly, as well as uh, your department heads here. Um, so this probably, I'm a broken record, at least I was with, with, um, with Mr. Jones, and I will continue to be. We're really trying to kind of get the word out here that our contractors are going door to door to try to identify customer service lines. if folks aren't able to fill out the survey electronically. And so in this day and age, a lot of us don't appreciate people coming door to door for anything. So we really would appreciate if you would be so kind as to help us get the word out. Um, we are finding galvanized and lead in the municipality. And so it's really important that we can identify that and start flipping those out um, for our customers. Um, it's precautionary, but you know, there's, um, it's kind of a big push from a health and safety perspective. So we put the SQR code there and certainly provide any other materials um, that might be helpful. Um, and just a little bit on um, a little bit of a little bit more of what what I uh, contribute to the team is just kind of making sure that everybody's familiar with our um, we have a lot of environmental um, workforce STEM grant programs available for 501 C3 agencies just met with the Norristown Chamber. President Kim this afternoon talking about some opportunities that we might have to work together. Um, so trying to get the word out there, we have a firefighting support grant program, which is, um, which is very popular, but we're always trying to make sure that everyone gets that information. Um, open to any ideas or feedback if there's other community efforts that you think Pennsylvania American Water would be a good fit for. I'd love to, to, to talk and to have a better understanding of how we could play a role. Um, we have school visits. We have Norristown High School, um, a couple different groups coming through the water plant just to give them a tour, um, trying to show them that, you know, a little bit more kind of behind the scenes of what happens in our organization and all of the career opportunities that might be available. We have actually one coming up on March 20th through, through the, um, the Chamber of Commerce and the high school. Um, so all kinds of good stuff there, and some of these pictures are just National Night Out, and some of the organizations that we support. Um, our, our, our plant manager there showing off some of the details. Um, so we'd love to continue to talk if, if there's any ideas um, after this meeting. And then I just would like to end with our customer assistance program, and I have a lot of other materials, and we even ha we have them in Spanish as well, if that would be helpful. 
Um, but we do, as a company, we have our own separate funding source available for our customers who are having a hard time paying their bills. Um, for um, for Narstown specifically, it's a water. We don't have wastewater here. So anything you know here on the water discount would apply. We have grants. If people are in, in um, threat of being turned off for non-pay, we have $500 emergency grants available. That usually helps to clear any back bill out. Um, and then we also have discount programs between 30 and 85% of a customer's monthly bill could be, be reduced based on their qualifications. And that's really an easy phone call. We do everything over the phone. We get them set up on an auto. Um, so this is really a really great service. It's not a government funded service, so it doesn't always catch with the other navigator services that are out there. So we're just really trying to make sure that everyone um, gets the word. And of course, I can be a contact to get folks where they need to be. I work with our other elected official offices often with their constituents getting people connected to this program. Um, so that's just a final push that we wanted to make, and we're here for any questions, or if there's anything we didn't cover that you're curious about, we're happy to talk about it. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you have an idea of the response rate around the lead pipe survey. I know that we have pretty high rates of lead poisoning in Norristown. Um, so just wondering how you're doing on term, in terms of response. Um, yep. Um, I uh, write in my cell phone right there. I have the specifics. But, but generally speaking, we're low on our responses. Um, you know, certainly we understand the door-to-door -door is not um, as popular, like I mentioned. Um, and... Um, I also think that if there's a renter, sometimes they're kind of not quite connecting with the landlord or something like that. So there's kind of a couple different idiosyncrasies there that we're trying to work through. But um, generally speaking, filling out the survey twice is better than not at all. And so we can send someone to a person's home. We can make an appointment if they're not sure how to check their water line. I don't know if I would have known before this program myself. Um, or even where their line, service line might be coming in for them to check. So we could either navigate folks over the phone, they can walk around and try to find it, or we could send someone in by appointment. It doesn't have to be kind of a cold knock. Um, so as m any service that we can provide to help answer those questions. Uh, but we are low in the municipality as far as our response rate goes. And I know I heard it, but I just want to clarify. The replacement, if there are lead pipes, is no cost to the homeowner... Right, so we come in, we will um, identify, and we'll try to be efficient. If there's 10 people that need replacement, we'll do them together. We won't, you know, um, do one D2Z if we, can, if we can coordinate that. But generally speaking, and if the team's already out doing work and they identify it, they'll flip it while they're doing the actual work with the, when the road's open. So there's kind of um, two opportunities. There's the self-identification for later replacement, or there's active replacement as we go. That's perfect, because I think um, one thing I've heard, because I've received the, the postcards and the phone calls, and um, so, so more than door-to-door, -door, I know, um, is, is people almost afraid to check because they didn't want to have, have to pay to have a big cost mm -hmm. associated with it. That's so a great you. point. Right, right. There is no cost to them. Um, and we're not suggesting, we don't want to create a concern for health and safety. There, we're not suggesting that there is a problem because of it, because there's different kinds of material, but generally speaking, we are trying to just be proactive and replace those, yep. Thank you. Thank you. The copy of, so we can share it, or? I have it electro, I have it all kinds of ways, I'll make okay. sure you get it, can yes. Just to Kevin? <laughs> sure, okay. sure, absolutely. Yep. Okay, so. and I'll also do, if, if you're okay with it, the last slide there about our income discounts, just in case that That'd be great. comes yeah. in, okay. Great. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to announcements, Mr. Vice President, any announcements? Oh, yes, we have a few. Um, but before we get started, we have Jesse in the background. If anybody needs a translator from uh, Spanish to English, uh, Jesse's there to help you, and she'll give you advice if you need one. 2024 special events, June 19th, Juneteenth, Jubilee Street Festival. Main and DeKalb Streets from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. July 4th, market calendars for all these events. July 4th, parade and a party in the park. 
uh, parade lunch, St. Francis uh, Sciences Church, Elmo Park firework finale from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. You get to meet us if you go out there. <laughs> August 11th, Taste of Norristown, back to school bash at Von C's Brewing Company from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. October 31st, Trunk or Treat, Norristown Recreational Center from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. December 7th, Winter Fair, Norristown Recreational Center from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. We also have Spring Basketball League starting in April. Youth Basketball League ages 8 to 16 hosted at Eisenhower School, my middle school. And uh, Biddy Basketball League ages 5 to 7 hosted at Norristown Rec Center. Uh, Registration is online through March 31st, uh, $50 per player, play through May and June. And we have Citizen Leadership Academy, which I think is pretty cool. If, if you haven't been through there, you should definitely go through there. Uh, Citizen Leadership Academy will start for the spring 2024 session on March 21st at 6 p.m. The CLA is a course for our residents to develop your skills as a community leader and understanding how municipality government operates. The class meets on Thursdays through early May. Applications are available online in the back of council's chamber due to, public, uh, due to the public information officer by March 15th. That is a pretty uh, good program, I took it myself. Also, um, I'll be hosting on March 25th, uh, Start the Path to Home Ownership uh, at the Norristown Library at 5 to 7.30 uh, p.m. They have these flyers in the back uh, if you want to grab one. And we are doing a town hall meeting at the library on April 8th uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 and uh, next meeting, I'll have flyers out there, and uh, we'll email it out as well. Any more announcements? Anyone? Thank you. Uh, we'll go into public comments. Olivia Brady. Good evening, Council. Olivia Brady, Stanbridge Street, Norristown. So back in November, you had given the county six months with which to come to some kind of decision having to do with the old Airy Street prison. That time frame is coming up. And as I understand it, the Montgomery County Planning Commission is in the uh, process of preparing an RFI, Request for Information. And part of that work involves various different background studies, such as historic structures report, environmental issues, and um, other things that may are needed to enhance the RFI going out. Six months is not enough time to prepare that and to get the RFI out to request um, somebody to come in to look at an adaptive reuse for this building. So I'm urging council to extend that deadline to possibly indefinitely or at least a year to allow all that information and work to happen so that we can have a good outcome on the reuse of this building. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. James Waters. Hamilton Street, the end of floods. Oh, this is the phone. Oh, cool. New technology. Unbelievable. I didn't know that the water company was going to be here, so I didn't bring my details on about that. But I did file a formal complaint. And what you need to know is the Norristown Reservoir is part of the Bureau of Mine Reclamation's rules and regulations. Soundings were supposed to be done every year to maintain the volume in our reservoir. The last time it was done was 1994, which proved that it was 47% full and at 50% it had to be filled. I gave all that detailed information to the PUC and I testified. And the bottom line is the pollution that is in the Schuylkill River now is the lack of stormwater management. In other words, the integrated water quality report for 50 years has gone from the DEP to the federal government saying our streams here are deteriorating at 9% a year. So constantly what happens is you guys are pulling polluted water out of there when in reality the coal companies that were responsible for it should be removing that and restoring 
our reservoir to its 100%. Therefore, reducing the volume, excuse me, increasing the volume and diluting the pollution that comes from the stormwater. Now, every ton of coal from 1951, when they cleaned it up to begin with, was supposed to go forward for repairing the navigation and maintaining the Schuylkill River. I have this report from the engineers. So, bottom line is, they need, this is what I asked for, among everything that I asked for, all the way back to doing something about the, the pollution that comes in the river, and what was her name? Christy English, the Resource Water Protection, says they have no jurisdiction to stop it. I say you do, because in the Pennsylvania Constitution, I believe you operating in here is responsible for it. How do you like it so far? I didn't expect this. Is my time up? Holy cow. Look, the blighted property thing. This is the new poster child, like 404 West Airy Street was, that we, thanks to the public works people, got cleaned up, so it's not such an eye world. This is the old bridal shop. Many people know about it. I got this up on next door, and we're getting a lot of input. I would turn that into a women's history museum. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you back there at home watching us enjoy this. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Anthony Yurk. Anthony Yurk, good evening, uh, Rosemont Avenue. Uh, your last point, the water saving devices, that would regard uh, uh, water barrels, uh, collecting water, something like that. Would that uh, reduce fees to anyone? If I'm collecting my own water to water my plants, if my entire yard is surrounded by plants and taking up all the storm water that falls off the roof and potentially nothing is going to the street because of all the plants, of the, the absorption, the water barrel, would that be something uh, qualifying a discount? I, I, yeah, I know no one's going to answer any questions. All right. So, uh, uh, Chief O'Donnell, I had given a picture that is the crosswalk at Hart Ramp and Main Street. So, you'll see that there is a disabled access point on the right and on the left by the U-Haul. Uh, the thermoplast lines across the street uh, extend only about one step from one side and one step from the other side. Based on the picture I've given you, you cannot see any of them. This was a rainy condition day. So, further on that, uh, the curb cut effect. So, that should be fixed, but I've been asking for five and a half years. Rosemont and Washington have no curb cuts for uh, accessibility. Forest and Washington does. Heart Ramp and Washington does. Rosemont and Washington does not. It has been five and a half years. You can look back in history and on all these videos and see that I've brought it up multiple times. So you have both of the things that I've given you now showing, uh, one, I'm documenting this as diligently as I can, and two, why are there no accessible curb cuts at Rosemont and Washington after five and a half years of asking, and we've now found at least 10 more around the Forest, Elm, Birch, and Beach area. Is this not a public safety concern? I will save my 45 seconds. Thank you. So, what a beautiful place you have here. Congratulations on this. Um, okay, I have a few things. Um, firstly, I agree with uh, Olivia as far as an extension for the, um, the prison RFI. It's just not enough time to do all the research and everything that, that needs to be done to repurpose that, that building. Uh, the other thing is... Um, there is a benefit uh, that's going to be happening in April, and it's called uh, She Fest 4, and it's being held by uh, Vinyl Closet Records to benefit um, Laurel House, uh, which is a, a safe place for battered women and children. Um, there will be 15 women 
from the local area that will be performing, and the date is April 28th from 12 to 4, rain date uh, May 5th. I will also be performing, and I feel so honored to have been asked because everyone that's in this show, they're way younger than I am. So I really feel very pri privileged to be a part of this, and it's to benefit. It's, it's for a good benefit. Rotation Records, they're the ones that are doing, like, the sound and everything, and they're right here in Norristown. Um, the other thing is my band called True Blue played out at um, the band show last summer, at the end of the summer, and we were very well received. A lot of the people in the audience remember me from Mean Changes, and they were delighted to see me up there being a front woman, front woman of a rock and roll band. Um, we would like to perform there again this year, and um, I've reached out, and I haven't really gotten a response yet, so I'm hoping... Um, I know Erica isn't handling it anymore. I did email her, but I didn't, I didn't know that. So I'm really, I don't know how to get in touch with anyone. Um, I've emailed and made a few calls, but haven't gotten a response. I have a card. So um, I think that's it. I'm being short tonight. I have extra time. Can I yield it? <laughs> but really, no, thank you very much. So... Thank you very much, and wishing you the best with this. My name is Cynthia Colbreth, and I live in East Norton Township, but I'm born and raised in Norristown, PA. And I'm here because um, I'm relatives and cousin to um, Olympian Josh Colbreth, who was a 56 Olympic Olympian who was born and raised out of Norristown, PA. Um, I'm here to present to council um, as a follow-up in November of 2022 um, regarding the idea of honoring our hometown Olympian Josh Colbreth, who was a renowned Olympic bronze medalist, two-time Pan American gold medalist, and world record holder in our community. And um, I highlighted the significant contributions and in, in, in achievements of Josh. Um, he was a celebrated athlete and a proud Norristonian. And um, I thought that it would be an idea renaming an intersection of Coolidge and Brown Street located in front of Eisenhower Middle School after Josh because that's where his Olympic, um, his, um, his sports has started at Eisenhower High School. Um, he was a, a track star, he was a football star, he was played basketball, he won a lot of state championships for the school, as well as at Rittenhouse. And so I have conducted a thorough research on the guidelines outlined in the Norristown, Pennsylvania subarticle IBD Streets and Parking, specifically Section 282-249, Street Names and Signs. And according to these regulations, street names should bear a reasonable relationship to significant nature features or the history of the community, and all proposed names are subject to approval by the Municipal Council. Given that Josh is a state of stature um, and his deep histor historical ties to Norristown, I believe renaming a street in his honor would be fitting tribute to his legacy. And as a proud member of this Central Montgomery County Business Professional Women, I'm happy to inform you that my fellow sisters and I, along with our book club, would like to give you a copy of my first book as an author in honor of Women's History Month. I would like to present this book to council to have it on display here of all the, to chronicle all of Josh's legacy. I wrote extensively about his life and legacy of what he has contributed to Norristown and as an Olympian. And this is my gift to the council. I'd like to present it to you. You're welcome. And, um, oh, and, um, and with the Paris Olympic Games approaching later this year, in July through August, I believe there is no better time to celebrate our hometown hero, Josh Colbreth. Renaming a street in his honor will not only pay tribute to his achievements, but also showcase Norristown's pride in its remarkable res residence. Thank you. And may I present this to someone, Kevin?
Well, it's on. Hello. My name is Patrick Monahan. I'm actually a resident of Philadelphia, but I work in Montgomery County on the circuit trails. I want to present some information on the regional trail network really quickly. Um, so I'm the regional organizer of the Bike Coalition, but I'm also on the steering committee of the Circuit Trails Coalition. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Circuit Trails Coalition tonight. The Circuit Trails Coalition is a collaboration of 60 plus nonprofit organizations, foundations, and agencies working uh, to advance completion of the completed, the connection of the no network of multi-use trails um, in greater Philadelphia region. In the last 12 years, the region has added over 160 miles of circuit trails, and when the currently 30 plus miles of fully funded trails are accounted for, the region will have 420 miles of trails, which is reaching the, the, long, run, the long range goal of hitting 830 total miles um, of circuit trails throughout greater Philadelphia. I have a few specific comments I'd like to make in regards to the progress made of the circuit trails and proposed connections uh, in the municipality of Norristown. Um, in Norristown, there are two major multi-use trails that connect to the municipality. First, we have the Schuylkill River Trail, um, this makes up a significant portion of the regional trail network, which connects our communities and provides opportunities for recreation and commuting seamlessly between Philadelphia and Pottstown. Second, the Chester Valley Trail. Uh, this recent completion extended of the trail from Chester County, passing through three municipalities, Upper Marion, Township, Bridgeport, and Norristown. Montgomery, Montgomery County uh, is fully accessible existing segment in Chester County that extends 14 miles west into Exton, completing this trail's regional trail development efforts. And third, uh, what I'd like to be here to focus on specifically here today is the future of what's called the Liberty Bell Trail. Um, this is a connection that would be um, from Upper Gwinnett down to Norristown. Um, recently, the feasibility of constructing a multi-use trail between Parkside Place and Upper Gwinnett Township and the Google River Trail and the municipality of Norristown was led by a design firm to identify the best route for this critical connection. Um, this 1.5 mile segment is looking at streets in the municipality of Morristown, Norristown uh, to reach the farm park. The streets of Stanbridge Street from the farm park to Beach Street, two blocks of Beach Street, and Halls Avenue from Beach Street to Washington Street, where the connection is made with the Schuylkill River Trail. The coalition is interested in coordinating with the municipality regarding parking enforcements and all potential design solutions. Members of the Circuit Trails Coalition will continue to advocate to accelerate development of the circuit trails in order for the region to meet its long-range plan goal to build up the full network by 2040. Uh, we are in an inflection point with federal funds being made available and make it possible for Greater Philadelphia area to make itself a stronger and more resilient region that continues to grow to better accommodate the number of people walking and biking uh, safely for transportation, recreation, and community activity. Thanks. And if I could share my notes with anyone. Hi, uh, Jenny Cho, uh, Barbados and Airy. Uh, I, I'm speaking about that whole neighborhood. I would like to know, the city council, uh, is the municipal council members, are they, how committed are they to making the downtown Norristown safer? Because I know the new chief is committed. I know she is. I see her charisma, her enthusiasm. Um, what about you guys? Who's representing the downtown in terms of the families and the children, what they want, a safer downtown? Um, there was a stabbing just like up the street here last night. I don't know if you guys know. Uh, you know, there was a, an assault on Marshall Street last week. Like there's issues like all over. So, you know, who are the city council people who are paying attention to these safety issues? Who are they? I'm going to meet with uh, Senator Capaletti um, this Thursday, I think. Um, I've invited all of you to come join me um, because I want to talk about my neighborhood. Main Street, Barbados, Markley, Erie, Marshall, that whole section in front of the uh, SEPTA Main Street train station. It's just like there's people drifting in and out. And you guys are, already know this because I've I've come here talking a lot about all the loitering, you know, many of which is drug related, and we need to address this drug problem. And if 
You know, I went around to area businesses with a petition that I also emailed you guys asking for support to reduce drug activity, drug opportunity in the neighborhood, and increase a family-friendly, child-friendly environment. So I got a bunch of signatures. I got a bunch of support from some area businesses on Main Street, you know, also the Mako on Erie. And, um, you know, some, you know, some businesses were not so available. The McDonald's, that manager there, she just, she couldn't help me. Can you help me? You know, if issues keep happening in certain neighborhoods, you know, you should look at it and pay attention to it and try to solve the problem. Yeah, it may not be where your house is, but it's where my house is in this neighborhood. When I look out my kitchen window, I see this big lot and I see everything all the way to the train station, to Main Street, you know, to Markley, like up Airy. I just see a wide, you know, view, landscape view of all these things going on. And um, when I look out the window, when, when my child looks out the window, I want her to see good things. Um, I do think we need more cameras in the downtown if my neighbors, anybody's neighbors, are not going to report things that they see. I feel like I've been reporting for people. Like, I live in a duplex, second floor. My first floor tenant, uh, we have at least... It's resolution 24-25, request for council to approve appointments to boards and committees. Move. Right. Uh, we're 25 appointing uh, members to the Civil Service Commission. Council, any questions? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve Resolution 24 25? Second. Madam Secretary. Rebecca Smith? Aye. Rashad Bates? Aye. Tiffany Henley? Aye. Lauren Hughes? Aye. William McCoy? Aye. Leslie Freeman? Aye. Aye, the ayes have it. Resolution passes. Moving on to buildings and code compliance. We have the Historical Architectural Review Board of February 2024. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Council, before you is a request to approve or deny the HARB applications, which were received, reviewed, and recommended for approval by HARB for February 2024. As you all know, the North Star HARB receives applications on a monthly basis for exterior repairs, alterations, demolitions, and renovations for properties located in Norristown's historic districts. Those applications are reviewed by the HARB members to confirm that the repair, alteration, demolition, or renovation work is in compliance with the municipal ordinance. Uh, the HARB reviewed two applications in the month of February, 558 Hamilton Street and 701 DeKalb Street. And the request before council is to uh, please approve the COAs as recommended by HARB. Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the hard board February 2024? So moved. Second. Madam Secretary. Rebecca Smith? Aye. Rashad Bates? Aye. Tiffany Hanley? Aye. Lauren Hughes? Aye. William McCoy? Aye. Leslie Cleveland? Aye. Thomas LaPera? Aye. The ayes have it. <laughs> motion passes. And we'll move into the department update to municipal council, Mr. Singh. All right, thank you, Council. Uh, so first thing first, I promise I'm gonna keep it short. I know in the prior years I had a 100-page report. I did my best, and it's down to like 33 pages. Uh, so even though it's less pages, we still did a lot of work. 2023 was a great year for the department. We accomplished a lot, and I look forward to sharing with you what uh, me and my team completed this year. And with that, uh, I did give an executive summary for Council. Uh, and I'm just going to concentrate on the information that I shared on that executive summary and just keep it to highlighting all of those items. Uh, so this is for the 2023 uh, operations for the department. I want to take this moment to uh, introduce to everybody who hasn't met Keith Gordon. He's the assistant codes compliance manager and assistant building official for the municipality. And uh, with him and our team, we were able to accomplish a lot. And I really appreciate all of the hard work he does every day. And the success of our department is not just with the 12 members that work for the department, it's all of council, all of the department heads, the solicitor's office, and all of the professional uh, staff that supports us. And then most importantly, 
I do want to thank all of the property owners, business owners, and residents who voluntarily comply with state and municipal codes, and their voluntary compliance is greatly appreciated, and we hope that others will follow in their path. And I truly appreciate, appreciate them for being uh, responsible members of the community and in supporting uh, the building code mission of safeguarding health, safety, and welfare here in Norristown. So I'm just going to go over some very high-level highlights for the department. In 2023, we upgraded our Norristown ISO BSEG score. Uh, previously, our uh, classification was actually pretty low, and when we had our initial uh, evaluation done in 2019, we were actually able to bump up our classification in commercial and residential properties in two categories. And that's going to be really beneficial for property owners. It's going to help improve their insurance premiums. It's going to be extremely important with all of this development that council is working extremely hard and diligently with municipal uh, development planning uh, director Jane Massanier. It's very critical for the developers to know what our ISO classification is. The fire department has done their part in upgrading their classification, so it's really going to benefit all of the property owners and developers here in Norristown. So our new score for the department is 87.94 for commercial buildings, which also includes industrial, and for residential, we're at 82.88. The Pennsylvania state average for commercial is 71.5, and residential is 65.04. So as you can see, we're extremely above the state average for the scores. Uh, it was brought earlier during the council meeting about you know there being a lot of lead poisoning here in Norristown. That is a fact, and thanks to municipal council taking action a couple years back, you guys implemented the lead poisoning prevention ordinance. <clears throat> and because of that, last year, uh, we actually were able to certify as lead safe or lead free over 50% of all rental properties here in Norristown. And our goal is by the end of 2024, we want to have 75% of all rental properties be either lead safe or lead free because it's important to make sure that the most vulnerable uh, residents of our community, the children, are safe. Uh, the next item I wanted to highlight is our complaint and concern request tracker. That's something that the administrator's office has implemented. Kevin works very hard with us regarding that. We have this great online tool. We hope all of our residents and stakeholders utilize it. You can actually go online, put in your complaint or your concern, and it assigns a case number. It'll actually notify you via email automatically who your assigned inspector is, what the outcome was of our investigation, if we issued a ticket, if we went to court, whatever the issue is or the outcome was, we share very brief summaries. That way, our uh, stakeholders know that we did follow up and we are doing something about their complaint or concern. So since that's been implemented, we've actually done over 1,650 complaints on the request tracker now. We've upgraded our department technology. Uh, our uh, aim is by June of 2024, we're actually going to have an online portal for the property owners, the business owners, and residents. That way, they can apply for their contractor license online, they can renew or apply for their rental license online, they can pay for their permits online, their tickets, uh, rental license invoices, they'll be able to submit the documentation to us for inspections like chimney search, heater search, lead search, they'll actually be able to log in and see all of their property information, um, and it's just going to help make uh, business a lot easier uh, with stakeholders and Norristown with having this online 24-7 portal. So, we're working with our uh, technology solution provider, and we've had several meetings, Keith and myself, and our goal is to go live in June of 2024, and we'll keep you updated with the progress on that. So, council has done seven major ordinance adoptions in the last couple years. So, we've been continuing to implement, administer, enforce, and comply with all of those requirements. Uh, from HARB, reducing HARB, to ensure that properties are getting repaired faster and in a more cost-effective manner. We created the Quality of Life Quick Ticketing Program, where we have actually 15 different violations now. Uh, we've issued over 8,750 quick tickets. That's for like grass, trash, animal waste. Um, we're working with uh, banks to ensure that they're registering abandoned properties with us or foreclosed properties with us. We created the Norristown Building Safety Property Maintenance and Housing Code, and there were so many 
additions and modifications to the international code. And one of the major ones I wanted to point out was section 114 emergency accommodations. Because of council adopting this code, one of the requirements that property owners, specifically <clears throat> landlords have to comply with now is if their property is deemed uninhabitable or unsafe because of failure to maintain their property, they're now required to provide uh, uh, housing accommodations to the tenants, to our residents. And since you guys have adopted that uh, code, we've actually helped over 135 Norristonians ensure that they have somewhere to go when there's a fire or sewer leak or something along those lines when the property was deemed unsafe. So thank you, Council, for that. Um, contractor licensing, we actually have professional contractor licensing requirements now for commercial contractors. We've actually issued over 1,300 licenses and in residential endorsements since that requirement has gone into effect. We already touched on the lead poisoning uh, prevention program, and we've also streamlined renewing of licenses. So before, people would have to fill out the paperwork and submit it to us. Now we actually just pre-populate everything, send it to them. If they got to update anything, they can update it right on the form, send it back to us, and we'll process it. So those are some of the updates. Um, <clears throat> highlights, I should say, and just so uh, the community is aware, you know, the building code department has a lot of important work that it does on a daily basis. So there's 12 members on my team, including myself, and the 12 of us are responsible for almost 10,400 tax parcels here in Norristown to make sure that they're safe. And uh, we are working diligently every day to make sure that we are meeting those uh, goals. And I just have a quick picture here of our entire team. I just want to, you know, take a moment to recognize my team. We're actually uh, one of the only accredited code enforcement agencies in Pennsylvania. We got that accomplishment in 2019. It's good for five years. We're actually going to be renewing our accreditation uh, this year in 2024, and we hope to continue to meet uh, national standards for our operations. And speaking of my team, Combined, we have over 135 years of experience. We're multilingual, we're very knowledgeable, um, and obviously we've won several national, um, state, and international awards for what we do here in Norristown. Going back to what I was saying, you know, we're a very uh, busy department. We actually either enforce or assist in enforcing over 40 different local laws here in Norristown and several state laws. Now getting into the stats, um, for, for buildings, we issued 1,615 permits in 2023. Uh, that's an increase of over 38%. Uh, the average time to process a permit was only 3.6 days. And I'm very proud to report on that because we understand how critical it is when a contractor or property owner files their completed permit application, how important it is for us to review it and process it immediately. So this 3.6 days is from the time we receive a completed application to the time we review it. They may take a week to come in to pay for it, so it's actually issued, but we did our part in 3.6 days. And that is really one of the lowest, you know, approval periods you're going to get in the surrounding area. Uh, regarding permit inspections, we completed 2,163 inspections last year, which is an increase of 70, a little over 70% from the year prior. Um, you, get, you guys are all going to get a copy of this report like previous years. It'll be binded and also an electronic version, but we did some additional breakdowns for the types of permits and number of permits. <clears throat> for code enforcement, we issued 4,930 notice of, notices of violations last year. Uh, that's an increase of over 51% from 2022. And within those violation notices, there were 5,849 different violations that we found um, which is also an increase of over 44%. So I did give to council a little chart to kind of give an idea of what are our most pre like frequent proactive code violations. And, uh, you know, you guys will have that information. Regarding quick tickets, uh, we issued 3,181 quick tickets in 2023, which is an uh, increase of 6.5% from the year prior. And we did give a breakdown of the types of uh, quick tickets that we're issuing here. Uh, for property transfers and use and occupancy inspections, we work very closely with the fire department and fire marshal Lock, uh, Rich Lockhart to conduct all of the commercial inspections uh, for UNOs. 
2023, we did 769 property transfer UNO inspections, uh, where we found 16,618 violations. And the reason why I say that's important is a lot of times you may get calls from property owners or realtors saying that, you know, I don't understand why I have to get this inspection done, but the importance is right there. When we perform a property transfer inspection, on average, we're finding 21.6 code violations. And that's critical for the property owner to know for the current residents and even for the buyer to understand what it is they would have to do to make sure that their, their family is safe and they'll be safe or their tenants will be safe once they purchase the property. <clears throat> for rental housing licensing and inspections, as at the end of 2023 council, we had 3,594 rental buildings. That is slightly higher than 2022 because we've been working with uh, our team to make sure that any property that is a rental property that wasn't uh, following the process, having licenses, having inspections, got that done. And there are obviously some you know, properties that were turned into rentals on their own as well. So 2023 was a big year for rental inspections for us. We inspected 307 rental buildings, which is uh, 1,446 housing units. And that's a big increase from uh, last year. And keep in mind, council, we're actually um, uh, short staff currently. So if we would have had full staff, all of our inspectors, uh, we currently have four vacancies, two were actually filled, and we have two more. And once we actually have full staff, these numbers for this year and next year are gonna be even higher. Um, and with the rental inspections, we found 8,331 violations, uh, housing code violations where on average, during a rental inspection, it was a little over 27 violations that we found. I have the 2024 goals. Uh, and for finances, uh, I just wanted to share with council that we've been uh, diligently working with the council, the administrator, and the finance department. Uh, we, you know, we updated the fee schedule, and we have controlled our spending and the use of our resources in an optimal manner. And by doing so, the Department of Buildings and Code Compliance continues to be self-sustaining, meaning that the cost of the operations and services for the department are fully covered by the fees charged and revenue collected for the department. And with that council, I just have some other stuff here, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Right, thank you, council. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.